Now for something completely different. Uh, yet another uh, interest of mine is discrete global grid systems. So these are ways of tessellating the spherical Earth into chunks and usually hierarchically, geometrically origin uh, arranged chunks. It's useful for data indexing uh, and for a number of other things, but uh, but I implemented a, I didn't invent this DGGS, uh, rather this is Jeffrey Dutton's DGGS called the Quaternary Triangular uh, Mesh, uh, and I implemented it so that I could use it uh, in some research. So what is a DGGS? Like I said, you take the round earth, right, um, and you tessellate it somehow, break it up into pieces, the surface of it, break it up into pieces. People love hexagons. I love hexagons. Uh, problem with hexagons is you cannot tessellate a sphere with hexagons, at least not universally. You have to include a few pentagons. That's why soccer balls, for example, have a black pentagon and then a bunch of white hexagons, or at least the, the traditional design. However, there are a bunch of... Okay. <laughs> right. So, so there's a, uh, a bunch of ways that people have tried to design DGGISs. Some people have insisted and tried to use hexagons again with the odd pentagon thrown in. One of the, uh, one of the desires behind many of these different designs is that each tessera, each piece, is the same area as all the other pieces at that level, or at least that's one of the hopes. Uh, there are a few uh, DGGSs where that is true. Uh, however, they involve shape distortion. So this is basically the same situation you have in map projections, a topic I love, where you can have equival equivalent area or you can have equivalent shape. You can't have both. You must choose. So in a DGGIS, there are situations where, where people have gone for the equivalent uh, area, sacrificing shape, sacrificing orientation, size of the polygon, etc. I actually am a big fan of the DGGIS on the far right, which is the one I implemented, which doesn't actually preserve either in perfect levels, but it's a, it's a really intuitive way of splitting the Earth into facets. A lot of DGGISs start with a platonic solid, right? So this is, you know, old ancient philosophical mathematics about about these uh, these ideal shapes and whatnot. An icosahedron is a is a uh, frequent choice, actually, especially with the ones that try to go for equivalent area. But these platonic solids, one of the things about them is that they can all be inscribed in a sphere. Right? They all fit perfectly with all of their corners on the surface of a sphere, which is why they use, which is why they're sort of an ideal geometric starting point. The octahedron in the middle there, eight-sided, it's like two pyramids on top of each other. That's what we start with. Uh, well, here's an example of an icosahedral DGGIS and further development of that sort of thing. So these things have been developed by cartographers, but also astronomers who want to divide the sections of the sky that they're looking into and what have you. The quaternary triangular mesh developed by Jeffrey Dutton that I implemented is based on a octahedron. So you can see on the left there, that's an octahedron circumscribed by a sphere, by Earth, right? And if you take each one of those triangular faces, there's eight of them, if you take them and you subdivide them into four more triangles the way you see there, basically you just cut this line in half, put a point there, cut this line in half, put a point there, etc. New triangle, four of them. Um, if you do that, you can continue doing that for an arbitrary amount. I mean, you can do it infinitely, right? But you're really only going to do it to... 26 levels, I think. We're talking about centimeters on the Earth or something like that. So um, so you can chop down the Earth this way, and really what this is is a quad tree. It's just 
different shape. It's a triangular quadtree, not a, not a rectangular quadtree, but it's still every tessera breaks into four, breaks into four, breaks into four. Discrete global grid systems are actually now an OGC standard. They're quite new. Uh, this was uh, out in 2016. OGC was, was uh, asking people, hey, tell us what you think about this stuff. And by the next year, they made it a standard. So it's one of the uh, basic, if you will, file format data models that at least some people think Makes a uh, makes a big difference. I don't think it really replaces raster or vector or anything that fundamental, but it does give us uh, a new and interesting way of indexing space. One of the nice things about subdividing like this, as you can with a quad tree, is all you have to do is assign numbers to each one of the four subchild leaves, and then you have an index number all the way down. So if I give you a 10-digit string, you know that I'm talking about something that's been divided 10 times and exactly which one I'm talking about. So it works like an indexing scheme, just like latitude and longitude does on the Earth. That's a certain place at a certain size. So here we are again, Jeffrey Dutton. This is his model. Uh, it does not preserve area, and it does not preserve shape. It's a compromise between the two. However, it is really intuitive. I think it's much more intuitive than, say, an icosahedral breakdown, personally. Uh, lines up very well with the system of latitude and longitude already, with the equator and the North Pole and the South Pole. So octahedron, divide, divide, keep going. So you divide these shapes and you project their edges because, remember, the Earth is flat. These shapes, or sorry, yeah, the Earth is round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, whoops. The Earth is round, and, uh, and these shapes are flat. So once you have them, they're inside tan or uh, secant inside the Earth. So you have to project them out up onto the surface. But you do that every time, and you're off to the races. So this is the very beautiful and exciting product of my script. Uh, but this is just the first level. This is what it looks like as a equirectangular flattened out map projection, right? So the plot carré. But we keep subdividing. There's a fun, fun fact here. The top edge and the bottom edge are a single point because that's the North and South Pole, right? However, in the data, I had to model it as if they were two separate points so that... 2D GISs know how to draw it. If I hadn't done that, you'd get chaotic drawings. But basically, divide, 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 divide. Right? You get you get a uh, a breakdown, and every one of these has attached to it as an attribute that uh, numerical string of digits zero, one, two, and three uh, that tell you exactly where that index is. So a little bit more convincingly just threw together a very quick whirlwind demo just to demonstrate what that looks like on spherical geometry All right that's level 4 so four divisions down from the original uh, octahedron also github also free um, and uh, available for anyone. It's again a command line interface. It really, rather, I mean, I could just build the data set once and give people the data set, but the issue with that is the data set starts to become enormous. It grows geometrically. Every level is four times bigger than the previous one. So uh, instead, I just built a script that will draw however many levels you want, uh, placing those vertices and then using GDAL, I think it was. To, to parse everything together. So on the command line, you simply tell it where you want your output and how many levels you want, and it starts drawing. I've used it in a couple projects with colleagues before. This was a geovisualization application looking at a whole bunch of news data that was being classified and geolocated on the Earth, and there you can see the QTM in the background. So we were uh, basically detecting when these points fell into their facets and categorizing those facets in a choropleth style. 
also built a little while ago built a application for teaching that demonstrates the modifiable arrow unit problem. So that's the issue that when you change size or change shape of any aggregational unit, the statistics change radically. And uh, and this uses a DGGIS with a bunch of points in Africa, just because. And uh, and you can shift the DGGIS, or you can go to different levels, which are bigger or smaller, and you see that the choropleth pattern drawn for across Africa starts changing a lot. So it illustrates the modifiable arrow unit problem. There are uh, some interesting issues with this. Uh, most con most uh, typical GISs are very 2D and not so 3D, and uh, so. Each facet, for example, is basically defined by the corners, by the three points that make up its corner. But that means that this arc, the straight line drawn between the two corners, is drawn in a 2D GIS, it's always drawn straight. And in this map projection, it's not straight, it's curved. So if we start getting really proper, this is the issue we have. So this is wrong. This is less wrong, okay? And you can see, for example, that Salta does not belong in zone 60, but ArcGIS or QGIS will tell you that it does. That's because our, that's because they're not doing they're not doing the geodetic calculation. They're doing the calculation in the coordinate space of the map projection. They're assuming the world is flat. So uh, one has to be careful about that sort of thing. So a next step for me is to implement in the same library a geodetic point and polygon algorithm. Uh, pretty easy to do. Well, uh, fairly straightforward to do. The classic point and polygon algorithm works. You just have to use geodetic lines as in great circles, not, uh, not straight arcs. But that's on the books, that's what I'm planning to do. And I'm also planning to be able to create subsets of the grid. Once that point and polygon thing is worked out, then you should be able to identify only those facets that intersect with a mask data set and draw only those, which will help with the enormous file size once you're talking at you know, level 16 and up. I also am currently about to implement this project with a colleague of mine. We're looking at different strategies for anonymizing uh, census data, basically, and we've been using two-dimensional quad trees, but we're, uh, we're going to want to do this on a three-dimensional surface to take into account large areas like Europe. Right? This is my uh, Polish colleague, Adam Inglot. So future plans for what to do with this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, are there any questions? Yes? Thank you. Uh, very nice presentations. Um, I was wondering, these seem like, like true, I guess, Unix-style scripts that, that by themselves do something so you can integrate it in something bigger. Do you have any plans to put it in something bigger or integrate it more with anything? Or are they fine the way they are? I mean, I've thought about making them as a QGIS plugin, maybe. Um, but uh, I mean, and I've also thought about just building a basic GUI for for either of them. Um, but I, I kind of do a lot of things like this, and I don't know. I I, I feel like at least for anyone who can, anyone who's reasonably comfortable writing software, I think they're easy enough as they are. The, there's a there's a help file, you know. Um, and because they're shell tools, you can use them from any language, basically, as long as you call the shell. Uh, but of course, that depends on proficiency with software, right? Um, the flow maps one, I think, is probably the best candidate for making a QGIS plugin, maybe. Uh, but uh, yeah, no serious thoughts in that direction. But uh, you know, I mean, if if there was a lot of interest and if people were like, oh, it's great, and you know, I, I wish it was a part of this, then then that would probably motivate me to do it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks again. 
I understand your interest is mostly in visualizing things. Um, these grids remind me very much of the grids used in uh, climate models or weather models. And uh, mm. there it's also very important that the area and so on is preserved because you need to know uh, exactly how much heat or momentum or whatever is transferred between them. So they are also from a computational point of view, that's very important. I was wondering if you have also looked at the grids used there or that it would perhaps be interesting to explore that. Sure. Yeah, I, I uh, at the risk of being wrong, a lot of the climate models I've seen do not actually preserve area. They're, they're square voxels. Or, or, sorry, not voxels, but they are the frustrum produced by extending the radii out of the earth from a square. So they, they make a, a vase-like shape. I could be wrong. Uh, but I think I've seen some old ones at least that way. However, some of the newer ones, mm -hmm. like the Isaiah, that's one that gets fairly popular. That is equal area, mm -hmm. uh, and it's icosahedral. So the area is the same, mm -hmm. but the, uh, I don't know, it's sort of my, my philosophical opinion. The area is the same, but the directionality isn't. Mm -hmm. Right, this is not isometric. So flat hexagons or flat squares, well, squares have an issue, but flat hexagons are isometric in that the distance to the neighboring cell is always the same, or the distance to the centroid of the neighboring cell is always the same. That's not true here. It can't mm -hmm. be true mm -hmm. here, not on a spherical Earth. Right, so. Um, I, I understand why you would want equal area. I think that works especially well for aggregate statistics, but I'm not sure it works well for aggregate spatial modeling unless you are compensating for the anisotropy. I, I, I'm sure they do, but um, you, I know a, a recent one is uh, the ICON model, which also uses one of these icosahedral grids, I think. Okay. Might be interesting to check out. I, item? ICON. Icon. Yes. Okay. We can discuss more in detail about this. Thank you very much, Paolo, for, for, for your you. presentation.